Hello and welcome to Within the Frame. I'm Handan in Seoul. It's been almost a year since the leaders of South Korea, the United States and Japan gathered in Camp David, a U.S. presidential retreat near Washington, for a summit that marked the beginning of a new era in trilateral cooperation. The historic summit yielded a joint statement that led to implementation of various measures in bolstering trilateral security ties, the efforts of which were formally institutionalized last month. But a swirl of challenges lie ahead amid evolving threats in the Indo-Pacific region, rising geopolitical tensions and leadership uncertainties in both the U.S. and Japan. Camp David Summit one year in, progress and challenges. That's the topic of our discussion today. And joining us via Skype is Mason Ritchie, professor of international politics at Hankook University of Foreign Studies. It's always great to have you with us. Great, thanks for having me. We also have Pan Gil-ju, research professor at Korea University's Ilmin International Relations Institute with us tonight. Always a great pleasure. Hello, good to be here. All right, Professor Pan, let's start off with you. This week marks the one-year anniversary of the historic summit at Camp David, held between the leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. How would you evaluate the achievements and progress made so far in the three nations' security cooperation? To be honest with you, it is true that the trilateral architecture between South Korea, the United States, and Japan, spurred by the Camp David summit, has been consolidated over the last year. As you might be aware, this trilateral political agreement has been transformed into TSCF, Trilateral Security Cooperation Framework, which means it has begun to be institutionalized. Likewise, high-ranking officials are scheduled to meet on a regular basis to enhance trilateral cooperation. The trilateral architecture has also contributed to enhancing their capacity to grapple with North Korea's nuclear threats. These three countries have activated a shared system to detect and assess North Korea's missile firings in real time. Moreover, they have begun to conduct trilateral combined exercises. The first trilateral exercise was carried out under the name of Foreign Freedom Edge in June 2024. As of right now, the trilateral architecture is not far from the level of a full consolidated institutionalization, but at the same time, it is also true that this architecture has been advancing more rapidly than expected. Furthermore, the trilateral architecture between South Korea, the United States, and Japan has been recognized as the first minilateral framework made in Northeast Asia under the new corridor mechanism. So this framework has been paid attention to around the world. Meanwhile, a well-manageable level of cooperation and institutionalization shows that this framework smoothly goes on so far, which is eligible for the world's attention. The U.S. has always wanted its two key allies, South Korea and Japan, to get along, right, to bolster security ties among the three nations. And although thorny issues remain, the trilateral defense cooperation seems stronger than ever before. And last month, as you briefly mentioned, Professor Pun, we saw uh, another historic milestone in the three-way security partnership. Dr. Ritchie, there was a loud buzz about South Korea, the U.S., and Japan's institutionalization of their trilateral security framework. Tell us about its significance to the three nations' efforts to further boost security ties and also share with us your perspectives on the controversies surrounding it. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, so as we just heard, you know, the uh, momentum for trilateral security and defense cooperation uh, among Seoul, uh, Washington, and Tokyo really picked up uh, last year uh, with the Camp David summit. Uh, and that covers uh, cooperation in intelligence, defense, uh, diplomacy, obviously, um, but also um, emerging technology uh, supply chain issues, um, you know, for instance, in artificial intelligence and things like that. Um, this is useful for uh, deterring North Korea uh, and although this is the quiet part that you're not supposed to say out loud, it's also useful for deterring China, which is, of course, not very happy about uh, this cooperative mechanism. 
Uh, the worry, of course, uh, is ultimately more about domestic politics uh, in the three countries in terms of whether or not this trilateral uh, cooperation can continue going forward. Um, the most obvious risk from many people's uh, point of view uh, is what happens if Donald Trump wins. Uh, he's not a big fan of alliances. Uh, his relationship with uh, South Korea last time was very rocky. Uh, his relationship with Japan was built around uh, his relationship personally with Shinzo Abe, who has, of course, um, since passed away. Uh, and so there's some worry among some people um, that if Trump were to win the election uh, later this year, that he would come in in 2025 and not be very enthusiastic about uh, this trilateral um, uh, relationship, which is approaching the level. Uh, of uh, an alliance, of a trilateral alliance. We're probably not there yet in a strict definition, um, but in, in some ways, there, this is a budding or, or growing uh, trilateral alliance. Uh, of course, another risk is South Korea's presidential election in 2027. Uh, you know, Yoon uh, will be term limited out, so he can't run again uh, for president. And so if there's a progressive president who uh, moves into office, uh, in 2027 in South Korea, they may not be very interested uh, in maintaining this trilateral relationship either. And then, of course, Japan. And now we know that uh, Kishida is not going to stand um, for uh, the party uh, leadership position uh, in Japan uh, uh, coming up uh, in something like a month. Uh, and therefore, he's going to be out um, as prime minister very soon. Uh, and so there's a, a, a bit of a question mark over where, where Japan is going to be in terms of supporting this trilateral relationship. It's probably the least risky of the three uh, in terms of undermining it, but it's not impossible. So these institutional mechanisms, you know, we've heard Kurt Campbell, the uh, deputy secretary of uh, state, talk about uh, building out some type of you know formal secretariat uh, to advance the trilateral. That would be a form of institutionalization. Uh, we know last uh, month the uh, defense secretaries met uh, and put together a trilateral defense memorandum of cooperation. Although it's not legally binding internationally, uh, it does set expectations for trilateral cooperation going forward. And then, of course, as the professor just put it, there's you know also informal elements such as expectations of leadership meetings uh, um, at the leader level, at the minister level, at the vice minister level. Uh, in addition to the expectation of uh, military exercises uh, in a trilateral uh, format going forward. So all of those things are meant in some ways to, to tie the hands of countries going forward, uh, this three partners, so that it will be harder for them to undo uh, this trilateral cooperation mechanism. And as uh, Professor Meichi uh, uh, Ritchie alluded to, Professor Pine, some are raising questions about the sustainability of the formally documented trilateral security pact, particularly amid U.S. election uncertainties and Japanese Prime Minister Kishida's shaky leadership. Uh, as Professor Ritchie has mentioned, in fact, he announced today that he'll step down as the leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party next month, which means Japan will select a new prime minister. What are your prospects for the fate of the security framework? Well, uh, we cannot entirely exclude the possibility that a change in domestic politics negatively affects trilateral cooperation in the near future. The reason why the three countries rush to make an coordinated effort for institutionalization is that it can help reduce this possibility. Meanwhile, this trilateral cooperation was attainable under the top-down approach, which was initiated by three leaders. In this sense, if domestic politics are changed, this architecture might be affected. In short, this type of top-down approach is rarely expected any longer if three leaders are gone or become weaker in their political power. In this vein, a key question should be whether a bottom-up approach can function as an alternative to a top-down approach in the era of post-three leaders. Again, institutionalization matters to make a bottom-up approach functional. Let me take a look at what it looks like in more detail. First of all, if Kishida's political position weakens or leadership changes in Japan, this trilateral cooperation might be on the list to re-examine probably in, in a, in a uh, the one or uh, two months later type of things, whether this policy should continue to go on. The same worries goes to Japan toward South Korea. 
to put it another way, Japan is also skeptical of whether this trilateral cooperation can continue to go on under the post yun administration. Despite this worry, it is also true that both South Korea and Japan come from North Korea's growing nuclear capability. This commonality, shared threat, is most likely to make decoupling between the two countries harder, even though domestic politics changes later on. American politics has a more complex formula. If Trump returns to the White House, he is most likely to adopt the approach eliminating all Biden policies. Meanwhile, the trilateral architecture might be excluded from the elimination list because this policy is under bipartisan support in the United States. Despite this fact, Trump might ask the other two countries for money if they want to make the trilateral architecture by applying a transactional approach. In contrast, if Harris wins the election, this trilateral architecture is more guaranteed for survivor because she is most likely to follow Biden's policies. But at the same time, Harris is least likely to prioritize the issue of North Korea similar to Biden's. To top it off, Harris might adopt strategic patience 3.0, which means its policy is less willing to directly tackle North Korean issues than before. In this sense, the trilateral architecture is likely to focus more on international issues, such as countering China or addressing climate change, than North Korean issues. Thank you for that deep analysis, uh, despite so many uncertainties and so many uh, possible different scenarios. It, but it seems that having North Korea as the common shared threat will play an important uh, role uh, going forward, regardless of who takes power. Professor Ritchie, what are your prospects for the South Korea-U.S.-Japan trilateral security partnership going forward, and what could be some ways to maintain strong solidarity amid evolving threats from North Korea as well as Russia? Yeah, so I first want to echo um, what Professor Pan just said. Um, you know, the, the threats that are represented by North Korea and China are you know, ultimately the driving force behind this trilateral cooperation. If you didn't have uh, a nuclear armed North Korea that's hostile to South Korea and the United States, uh, and if you didn't have a revisionist uh, China, there would be a lot less uh, external pressure for uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States uh, to cooperate in the security and defense sector together. And those threats aren't going away. So the incentives for this cooperative, uh, you know, trilateral relationship to continue are going to be there. Uh, you know, that's looking at it from an external perspective. If you want to look at, you know, the, the bottom up and top down issue, which again, I think is an important thing to consider, you know, obviously the, you know, there are risks uh, on, you know, who's going to be at the top uh, going forward, as, as I talked about in, in my first response. Um, but the militaries of all three countries are generally in favor um, of this type of cooperation. The security experts uh, in the three governments are in favor of this. The intelligence agencies in the three governments are in favor of this. The, 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 the diplomats in the three countries are generally in favor of this type of cooperation. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a strong, um, a strong, you know, uh, comprehensive, you know, you know, top to bottom support for this type of um, trilateral uh, cooperation. Um, I'll also just say, you know, I also agree with the professor that I think there's a pretty good chance that if Trump comes in, uh, you know, he wouldn't simply scrap this type of trilateral uh, cooperation. Uh, you know, it might be put into a more transactional context. Um, it might be, um, you know, called something different. Um, they might rebadge it and rename it. But I, I, you know, I think that there's a pretty decent chance that Trump and his team actually hold on to, to some of this. In fact, even a lot of it. Uh, as I said, part, part of that might be the institutionalization, but part of that is also that it has a lot of bipartisan support. Um, there are, as I mentioned, however, some risks. Um, you know, one is potentially Trump. You know, he can be mercurial and he doesn't always listen to his advisors and his party. Uh, 2027 South Korean election again. You know, there's a risk that a progressive uh, president comes in and doesn't pay attention to this type of trilateral. Uh, as I mentioned, also we're not sure who uh, Kishida uh, will follow Kishida in Japan, uh, and there's a, 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 a I think a risk there, although a relatively minimal one. 
Um, you know, the other risk I think I'll point out is potential wedge driving uh, between the partners. Um, at some point, I expect China to try to break apart this trilateral relationship, relationship in some way uh, to, to pick on the, the weak link, so to speak, uh, and try to undermine this trilateral relationship. Um, North Korea will probably try that in some form or another, particularly if there's a progressive who comes into power uh, in 2027 uh, in South Korea. But overall, I think the prospects in the short to medium term for a continuation of this trilateral security and defense cooperation are, is actually pretty good. So you're quite optimistic about the sustainability of the framework, and uh, perhaps we shouldn't be overly concerned about Trump's possible comeback. Now, Professor Pan, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan contributed a joint opinion piece to The Washington Post, touting boosted Seoul-Washington-Tokyo security ties as a major feat of President Biden's Indo-Pacific diplomacy. North Korea was quick to react, saying it only brought the people of South Korea and Japan closer to a nuclear war. How do you interpret this? Well, the trilateral cooperation between South Korea, the United States, and Japan had been earlier seen as a final piece of getting things done by Washington, D.C. Well, in, in short, it was taken as almost impossible due to the estranged relationship between Seoul and Tokyo. Despite this fact, the trilateral cooperation is on the way right now. So the Biden administration wants to promote what it has accomplished, which had been regarded as an impossible task. Furthermore, the Biden ad administration believes that this promotion could be helpful for the upcoming presidential election in a situation where it is a tight race. When it comes to North Korea, Pyongyang's reaction could serve as an indicator we can guess how effective the trilateral cooperation is in countering North Korean threats. It is too early to tell how effective it is because it is a just bone architecture. But one thing is for sure, as you mentioned earlier, North Korea strongly condemns this trilateral architecture, which was possible under a closer relationship between South Korea and Japan. Pyongyang even attempts nuclear coercion. This condemnation and coercion could hint that this architecture is burdensome to North Korea and in doing so serves as a deterrent power. Now, Professor Ritchie, President Yoon is set to deliver a Liberation Day speech tomorrow, and uh, he has made unprecedented efforts to mend strained ties between Korea and Japan since the launch of his administration. But historical feuds continue to stand in the way between the two countries. Uh, Japan's Sado mine associated with uh, Korea's wartime forced labor was recently listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, once again angering the Korean people. In your view, how would President Yoon address Seoul-Tokyo relations in his speech against such a backdrop? Well, you know, I'm going to be honest with you and say I don't know what he's going to say. Um, but if I were him, what I would do is largely downplay uh, the Sado Mine UNESCO Heritage Site issue. Uh, you know, we have an expression in politics, uh, especially domestic politics, and this speech is really more domestic politics than, than international politics, and that is, if you're explaining, you're losing. And so if, if Yoon wants to go down the road of explaining why South Koreans shouldn't be less upset or shouldn't be at all upset uh, about the Sado Mine being listed as a UNESCO heritage site and what that means for um, the recognition that Japan uh, you know, has and the acknowledgement that Japan shows for its uh, World War II and colonial era war crimes, um, you know, he's just going to get himself into a morass of explanations where he's not going to come out of this any politically better off. So if I were him, I would downplay this and I would simply say that, you know, as a South Korean president, uh, I will instruct, you know, my diplomats and I will myself uh, continue to press for South Korea's interests uh, in general and also in, in the specific case of Japan and even more specifically with respect to the Sado mine issue. Uh, and, you know, we will never uh, uh, forego South Korea's interests. 
Um, and we will do everything that we can to resolve satisfactorily for South Korea's interests, uh, these historical issues uh, with Japan. Uh, but at the same time, we need a forward-looking approach on Japan. Uh, so I wouldn't go down the road of specifics on this. I wouldn't try to, to justify what South Korea's position on this UNESCO heritage you know, site issue is. Uh, I would simply, you know, largely, you know, underscore the fact that he's there to protect South Korean interests, both historically and uh, looking forward. Uh, you know, other than that, I think he's going to find himself, you know, uh, doing a lot of talking and explaining and not really convincing anyone uh, and essentially ending up making no one happy and not really moving forward on South Korea-Japan relations. The focal point of President Yoon's uh, Liberation Day speech is expected to be South Korea's new vision for unification. Professor Pan, what directions and policies do you anticipate from the Yoon administration regarding the path toward reunifying the two Koreas? Well, what it looks like can be drawn from what the UN administration has stressed so far regarding its diplomatic and security policy. The key concepts of the UN administration's uh, external policy can be summarized in three points, freedom, human rights, and democracy. First of all, the UN, UN administration has defined freedom as a cornerstone for making South Korea continue to prosper, as well as for making it possible for South Korea to rise to a developed country. Second, the UN administration has stressed universal values, particularly human rights. In this vein, while criticizing the prior administration's disregard for human rights abuses in North Korea, the UN administration defines human rights as one of the key issues for national security. Third, the current administration has put more emphasis on tackling the retreat of democracy around the world. That explains why the UN administration hosted the third summit for democracy in March. These three key factors are expected to embed it in the UN administration's new vision for unification. In particular, all these three key concepts accounted for, the new vision could seek a more clarified direction, which is a liberal democracy. The old vision was based on the national community unification formula, which is under three principles, independence, peace, and democracy. Meanwhile, the new formula seems to be reformed by clarifying the end state of unification, which is a liberal democracy, neither a unified communism nor a unified autocracy. Since a liberal democracy is embedded in South Korea's constitution, it seems that the administration believes that its new vision matters in preserving its constitution as well. In addition, human rights might be included in the new vision because you, the UN administration has paid tremendous attention to dealing with human rights abuses in North Korea. In the meantime, the denuclearization of North Korea remains to be seen whether the new vision reflects it. To be honest, the denuclearization of North Korea needs to be paid attention uh, to in a situation where Pyongyang attempts to become an officially recognized nuclear power by enhancing its cooperation with Moscow. However, the denuclearization of North Korea is more likely to be mentioned as an aim of nuclear security rather than one part of the new vision for unification because the link between the two concepts might not be clear enough to make it become a policy. All in all, harmonization between unification policy and constitution appears to be the key direction of the new vision for unification. In this sense, a liberal democracy should serve as a focal point. It's still under the wraps, but the new road to unification is likely to put more emphasis on liberal democracy, freedom, and human rights. Now, unification of the two Koreas may still seem like a distant dream, but at least we now have an updated and clear roadmap toward achieving it. All right, we'll leave it there tonight. Thank you, both of you, for your perspectives. Thanks for having me. Great, thanks for having me. And that brings us to the end of this show. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back with more same time Friday. Have a great holiday.